Why did Jesus make his friends, Martha and Mary, experience the trauma of their brother's death? And what does it mean when God weeps? What does the Lord want to tell us about the death and rising of Lazarus? Join us today as we answer those questions and more with Dr. Regis Martin, author of Looking for Lazarus, a preview of the resurrection. I'm Father Dave Pavonk and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Please stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And today we're talking about Lazarus and death and the resurrection. I'm joined by our very special guest panelist, Dr. Deborah Savage. I'm used to seeing Regis here, but Regis is here. She's the co-founder of the Siena Symposium for Women, Family and Culture, who is also a, pre a professor here at Franciscan University, which I'm delighted. We have our regular panelist, Dr. Scott Hahn who is the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest, known by everybody, regular panelist of uh, Franciscan University Presents, who is also a prolific writer and podcaster, professor of theology here at Franciscan University, uh, Dr. Regis Martin. So thank you so yeah. much for being our guest today. Yeah, no, I'm really pleased uh, to be here. I'm honored by the company I'm keeping. Good, uh, good. Surrounded good, as by we are. sheer luminosity, <laughs> almost too bright to bear. On that note, um, <laughs> as we continue forward, just a beautiful book, uh, Regis. Oh, thank you. What caused you, why did you write the book on Lazarus? Well, I mean, the, the obvious answer is I needed the money, <laughs> but uh, at a deeper level, uh, I've always had a lively interest in death like uh, John Webster, one of those Elizabethan uh, spellbinders. I could always see the skull beneath the skin, mm. which makes me sort of unwelcome company <laughs> at <laughs> you're, cocktail you're parties. At a party, right, right. But, but there's, there's a little story uh, behind this, uh, and you seem to be on your best behavior, so yeah. I'll share it. Good, thank you. Uh, some years ago, when I was casting about for another project, another book, uh, I turned to my wife, and that was my first mistake, uh -huh. because I was asking her, darling, do you think maybe I could write a book about love? <laughs> uh, St. Mary Magdalene, for example, uh, that would be the flashpoint, uh, maybe a before and after picture, a snapshot. And she said, you're not wise enough to write about love. So I banged out another book about death. death. <laughs> I've go. become something of an expert on death. And as I get older, I, I can feel his presence. Mm. I mean, my antique status uh, suggests that he's been peering over my shoulder for a while. And, and who knows, maybe he'll pop in before the show is over mm. uh, and you'll have to find somebody else and, to and talk me, to. Well, we can hope not. <laughs> but maybe just to, to begin there as well is that those two things are not mutually exclusive, death yeah, and love. Right, and, yeah. and that's really one of the things we, we had not talked about that, but I take it from this book is that those two things are actually intimately united, aren't they? Right, yeah. I mean, you don't have to be Woody Allen to yeah. write about love and death. Yeah. I mean, his treatment was pretty superficial. But yeah, the two go together. Love entered death yeah. uh, and vanquished it. And mm -hmm. that is, I think, the ground of an ultimate optimism. We don't have to fear death. I mean, we should think about it from time to time. You know, memento mori, remember that thou must die. That's salutary advice. But it doesn't have to be crippling. We don't have to be depressed, right. bent out of shape by the fact that we're going to die. I mean, it's the most democratic of, uh, of, of events. Everybody gets to participate. Everybody huh? gets a chance. Great. So why Lazarus then? Well, I mean, his story is almost as long as the passion narrative itself. Uh, and John is a master storyteller. Uh, and uh, the details are really fascinating. Here is a guy who literally dies. He's definitively dead, but he comes back. 
Jesus raises him literally from the dead. And, and that's pretty extraordinary. That's riveting. Pretty extraordinary. I mean, everybody would like to have someone like Jesus on hand yeah. when they die, just to speak into the crypt and say, come on out now, it's time to return to life. Yeah. But the funny thing about Lazarus is when he gets back, he doesn't have anything to say. Right, right. He's that whole fairly mute. You picture him at lunch with Martha and Mary, and Martha, the practical one, has to say repeatedly, oh, Lazarus, do get on with your food. <laughs> I mean, he has nothing to say. I mean, he's as silent as St. Joseph, but the silence, I think, is, is pretty pregnant. It, Especially because after the story of his resurrection in chapter 11 of John, in chapter 12, you have the, 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 the saddest twist when the Pharisees basically in, expand their plot, that they're not only planning to kill right. Jesus, but Lazarus, right. because of how many people are becoming believers on account of Lazarus. Yeah. So because without a word, true. like St. Joseph, he bears faithful witness right. in his own resurrection yeah. to the single greatest miracle that Jesus had performed, especially in John's Gospel. You have seven signs. This one is the sixth, yeah. his bodily resurrection, but Jesus' resurrection is the seventh, and that's more than just resuscitating right. his corpse, that's right. divinizing his humanity, but yeah. there we have it. Yeah. I mean, Jesus bursts literally through the gate and the grave of death and, and pronounces, I, I think, pretty uh, apodictically, death, thou shalt die. Love and life will have the last word. But before, maybe before we get to Lazarus and, and spend more time with that, you spent quite a bit of time about his Mary and Martha in the family and all that goes into that right, and, and the yeah. relationship there and, and what took Jesus so long and, and it's just such a beautiful story. So maybe what's so human? About that. Uh, yeah, it's wonderfully human that Jesus would have friends uh, and that he cares enough about them that when one of them dies, he would want to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he arrives, he weeps, which is really an extraordinary touch. This is God, and yet he enters so deeply into the human predicament. He feels our pain so profoundly that it, it catalyzes, it provokes uh, literally a, a cavalcade of weeping. Uh, that, I think, is so endearing, so touching. And yet Martha sort of rebukes him. You know, if you had come sooner, yeah, yeah. I could have spared you uh, all of those tears. So what kept you? Yeah. Well, that is the dark side of the miracle, though, <laughs> yeah. that he delays. Right. Yeah. He could have gotten there in time, and then he doesn't bother to apologize. <laughs> right. yeah. let, let me, I want to ask you, I've been dying to ask you this, actually, and I loved the book. It actually made me feel hopeful, because yeah. I'm on the, uh, on the downside of 50 myself. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you something. I want to read into this, this question something you say later in the book about King Lear. Oh, yeah. And you quote Mal Malcolm Margaret, uh, right. Muggeridge, Muggeridge, who makes yep. a quip about, well, Shakespeare could have given him a sedative at the end of Act One, but then there wouldn't have been a play. Right. And so that, that you, and then you say, well, uh, uh, then uh, it's not until the end that you get the point of the play. That's right, yeah. And so that, that to me gave a context for the entire book. All of a sudden it became clear that the reason that that takes place is because Jesus is trying to help us see the point of the play. Right. And suffering is, is necessary, even though I don't want to go through it, because otherwise I don't get the point of the play, and I'm in a play. Yeah. So this wonderful narrative emerges out of your explanation there that made it, all of a sudden I realize I am the protagonist in my own life. And this is what Jesus is trying to show us, perhaps. Uh, yeah, uh, I was struck when I first uh, read the line from Flannery O'Connor yeah. about death and suffering, having been brothers to her imagination. Uh -huh. And that sickness was sort of like uh, a trip to Europe but it was more instructive, <laughs> and you could only go alone. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are solitary uh, experiences, mm -hmm. but Christ enters into that solitude to sanctify it. Yeah. And, and about the, the, the business of, of King Lear, Muggeridge is spot on. Yes. Uh, there, there's the wisdom that Plato gives us, uh, that you can't move too quickly from the many to the one. We mustn't march right. uh, too quickly from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, because if we do, we miss, we miss all the intervening right. music. It's pretty dark, those dark, somber tones mm -hmm. of Holy Saturday, but something happens with right. Holy Saturday. Right. You know, God goes down into the abode of the dead, yeah. uh, and he wrestles with the strong man, and he, he 
he literally beats the hell out of uh, the devil yes, uh, and I conquers think. sin and death forever. So you need not go to hell. Christ having been there for us, he sets us free. He delivers us from that final uh, loneliness. But you've got to go through mm -hmm. the suffering to get to the yeah, other side. Let me ask you to talk a little bit further about something. I've always been struck by the fact that uh, Jesus waits four days to bring Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead. And one expects a parallel that somehow four doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? It should be three. Yeah, yeah. So why is it that it's a, it's a, there's a four-day gap? Why does that matter? Does it? I, I don't know if it's a, a function of the higher math or it's just mystery. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. It, maybe it's sort of like Jesus writing in the sand. We don't ever quite know what he wrote. Yeah. Uh, you can picture for yourself the little paragraph or speech yeah. that he delivers in the dust. Uh, I don't know, but it, I think it's instructive that he does wait. Right. And he waits, I, I think, because the disciples uh, are children. Uh, and if he doesn't wait, if he doesn't dramatically bring Lazarus back right. after four days yeah. of decomposition in the ground, they might not be as impressed. They might not be as, no, as right. convinced, right. as fortified with hope by that event. Right. And it also suggests that Jesus is not daunted. He's not put off by right. death. It, it, he, it, it's as if Lazarus were sleeping and I'm going to wake him up and he walks right into that tomb yeah. with the stench and the horror, the decay of yeah. death, and none of it inhibits him, and he simply speaks those words, get up, yeah. it's time to come back to life, Lazarus. Yeah, so That's just one, one more, com so sorry, but just one more comment on this. It was so clear to me that it was the, the reason that the dis one of the questions that we thought about for this session was, um, why didn't the disciples encourage him? Why didn't they push him? Why didn't they say, why don't you go? Yeah. And it strikes me that the reason that all of that happened was because he was trying to show them yeah. the point of the play. Right. Right. And yeah. they weren't getting it. Yeah. I mean, it's not enough to say it. You've got to show it. Mm. It has right. to be embodied. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it is a strange twist to the plot. Again, another aspect of the dark side of the miracle that not only does he delay but he almost deceives the disciples by saying he's asleep and right. he'll wake up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if he's sleeping, he right. will wake up, you right. know. Right. No, he's dead. Well, why didn't you say that in the first right. place, you know? What have well, we been doing? Right. 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 <laughs> Obviously, it's the same sort of thing with the little girl, you know, who is 12 yeah. years old and she's dead. Oh, she's just sleeping. Right. And then they're weeping and now they're jeering at Jesus. You know, but there's a sense in which the last paragraph of the book is confirmed in both miracles. That is, St. Therese, you know, I don't fear the separation of the body and the soul as much as I fear the separation from God. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and to me, that is the razor's edge. That's the laser precision right. strike yeah. of what Jesus does. So he performs this supernatural miracle as a sign that points to a much, much greater right. resurrection that is, again, not just bringing us back to this life, right. but drawing us into something much greater. I, I'm terribly fond of the story, and I love the yeah. book, yeah. but I'm fond of it because my first funeral as a Presbyterian pastor was preaching from John 11 to verse 25 from my grandmother's funeral down in Florida. And afterwards, my mother came up and she said, oh, that was wonderful. The res You don't really believe that, though, oh. do you? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. And you could tell that she was thinking that, well, the real miracle would be if my mother was brought back to me, you know? Mm. Right. Yeah. And so you have to kind of work with someone and show that, no, there is another side right. and there's yeah. going to be greater. I yeah. And I think that's one of the things I appreciated about the book, Re Regis, and then the way you articulate it was that, that it's such a human, all of the encounters yeah. are so human. I mean, who who couldn't experience running out to Jesus and say, where were you? You yeah. know, I, I, I called you, where yeah. were you? If you would have come, this wouldn't have happened. So maybe just speak about how, how you prayed through that and, yeah. and how it is that you came to be able to articulate that more. <laughs> I mean, death is the final cancellation uh, that prevents us from becoming what we most ardently desire to be. Uh, and it waits for all of us. Yeah. Uh, I quote uh, Cyril, of Jerusalem who says, there is the dragon sitting 
by the side of the road. We go to the father of souls, but it is necessary to walk by the dragon. Mm. Uh, Flannery O'Connor chose that uh, to adorn her first collection of short stories. She said nine stories about original sin. And what she does, she telescopes the moment in every character's life when they have to choose between the father of souls and the dragon. Mm -hmm. whether he devours us or we escape his jaws and arrive safely inside the kingdom. So it's dramatic. The conflict yeah. with death is pretty dramatic. It's yeah. fraught with, yeah. with, with, with eschatological pressure. Yeah. Uh, so it's a real puzzle, I think, to me. On the one hand, death is so banal, so boring, yeah. uh, it's commonplace, everybody has to die. It's the one inoperable condition. We grow old and then we die. It's perfectly democratic. But at the same time, it's you who must die. Right. Yeah. You must embrace your own death. Yeah. And if you have the attitude of Therese, you know, with, with whom I conclude the book, you don't worry so much. Right. Death will come, yes, but it's really Jesus who's coming disguised mm. uh, as death. He will fetch you. He will bring you yeah. to the Father. Having that sense, that certitude of hope, I, I think fortifies uh, all of us. Could a younger Regis Martin have written this book? Uh, no, 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 of course not. Uh, no, I, 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 I never thought about death. Yeah. 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 Okay. Although I came across a, a book by John Gunther entitled Death Be Not Proud. Yeah. And on the inside cover, I had my name, and I'd given a copy of it to my brother Michael, who's now dead. This was back in 1966. Mm -hmm. So I had read that book in high school, and uh, I must have had some sense, maybe not so lively, yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly not learned, a sense that death is really something we have to face. And we will. Uh, we are just getting started on this topic, so stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. Using the story of Lazarus, it's a really beautiful story because everyone is really confused as to why God would wait uh, to go heal Lazarus. And so it shows that God has a plan that often we can't see and understand. And so I think trusting that even when we can't understand um, that God has a plan and not relying on our own understanding, being able to trust that God has everything worked out um, definitely will make it a lot easier uh, to be able to trust Him and believe in Him. Walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. You'll explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage in the Holy Land, Poland, France, Austria, Italy, and more destinations. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about Lazarus, death, and the resurrection with Dr. Regis Martin. One of the quotes you have is, you say, the moxie of Martha. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. So, she, yeah, she's got lots of spunk. <laughs> yeah, she's a tough old gal. I mean, she's very practical, down to earth, uh, and she represents, I think, that side of the church, and we need it. I mean, somebody has to make lunch. Yeah. You can't spend your whole day sitting at the feet of Jesus. From time to time, you get hungry uh, for earthly food. And she's also impatient. I mean, her brother has just died. Jesus was his, one of his closest friends. She has summoned him, entreated him to come, and he keeps putting it off. And because of her moxie, you know, the force and spirit of her character, uh, she's, she's not going to uh, submit. It's she won't acquiesce. No. Right, right. She demands to know, why didn't you come sooner? You knew he was ill, he was dying, and now he's dead. Why couldn't you have prevented it? She has real faith. I was going to ask that, that question. Have done was that, that frustration or faith? Yeah, yeah she has faith. real faith, yeah. and and she she feels I think disappointed, yeah, dismayed. You didn't exercise this magical power you have, and now we've lost our brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I, I agree with that completely. That uh, she has such belief that he could have prevented it that she is truly upset that he didn't. Yeah. show up. And I think it, it's because of that, maybe, that he reveals to her, I, I know you're going to speak about this anyway, but I just oh, am please. dying to get to it, I am the truth 
in the way. Yeah. And it's so unbelievable, in, especially in that context, that he would reveal that to a woman. Yeah. John Paul II says in Mulieris Dignitatum, the fifth chapter of, of Mulieris Dignitatum, that this is one of the most uh, important passages in the gospel. And he's there talking about the guardians of the gospel message, going through each of the passages in the, in the gospel where Jesus treats women with a new kind of respect, right? Mm. It's a sign of contradiction. Yeah. So I'd love to hear you say more about why. Well, well before I do, uh, sure. that, that text that you cite from uh, Pope St. John Paul yeah. reminds me of, of another text in, in that uh, uh, encyclical, yeah. which elevates woman to a level that oh, is yeah. almost priestly when Absolutely. he suggests that the smile bestowed by the mother upon this freshly born child awakens the child to a sense of his or her infinite yeah. value and yeah. worth. Yeah. The child somehow comes to personhood, a well, consciousness yeah. that I am precious. Yes. And he says the same thing in his account of Genesis, whereby when woman ap appears on the scene, it's not until that moment, maybe this is me talking, I think he mentions it, because I know I build on it in my own work, it's not until woman shows up that man actually knows what he's there for. Yeah. And he, he comes to self-consciousness, right? Yeah. Without that encounter, it's great that you gave me the garden, Lord. I'm, I'll work at it diligently, but to what end? And then she shows up, and now he that understands. Mm -hmm. So, this, you know, it plays out again then in John's gospel, I yeah. think, yeah. So, I mean, it is, it is, I think, telling that thanks to a woman, mm -hmm. this catalyzing moment takes place and yeah. Jesus reveals himself as the resurrection yeah. and the life. Yeah. And she believes. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. utterly, wonderfully yeah. receptive right. to that. I mean, it's the news that she most wants to hear. Yeah. I know that, that you have the last word. You preside yeah. over life and death. Yeah. I trust yeah. that everything will come out well. Yeah, and it's at that point in the book, when I read that part, I had felt the tension building because I wanted you to get to the point. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's pages and pages of beautiful prose, unbelievable quotes from our tradition. It was just incredible. And finally you say, you, you quote this part, and you say there, what more do we want? There it is. He's yeah. declared it. Right. And I remember my heart leaping, saying, oh, it's true. It's mm -hmm. actually true. Yeah. Why am I so afraid, fearful And, and it's not death, just a declaration. Really? It's a dramatization. Yes, it's in it, flesh. It's going to be in yes. his very body. Right. Yes, I am the yeah. resurrection. Yeah. It's not some principle out there no. or some airy abstraction no. that we hope someday will show itself. Right. It's true for right me. Right now. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I've decided that death is just life without a body. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when my mother died. I got news of her death. It was kind of unexpected. And I was very sad and so on. And then I got up from my desk to walk down the hall to s talk to someone. And then I realized, oh my gosh, she's already seen the face of God. Yeah. I'm here thinking I'm, you know, I'm still alive. I'm cool. Mm -hmm. She's right. more alive. She knows it. Yeah. yeah. That was the same insight that flashed across my mind when my father shut his eyes for the last time. Mm. I thought to myself, at this very instant, he is looking upon mm. the face of God. I and I hope it's a happy exchange. Yes, right. yeah, life is changed, not ended. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that is so comforting. Yeah, it is. But may maybe to that, you said that this, I'm the resurrection life, that that's a game changer, that that's the hinge of everything. So maybe just how is it such that it's the game changer? Well, imagine if it weren't so. If death really were the last word, right. I, I think I, I quote Philip Roth, who says, the meaning of life is it ends. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an invitation to despair. I mean, why not slit your throat right now right. if it's all going to end in extinction? Right. Or the poet Philip Larkin, mm -hmm. uh, right. that this is it, mm -hmm. that, that somehow death becomes the foreground to an everlasting extinction. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I was reflecting in, uh, several times in the book was, Hasn't COVID and the whole COVID thing, didn't that put death front and center yeah. in, in our culture? And it seems to me we didn't handle that very no, well. We, did we didn't not. look at no. it. And we try to do everything we can to try Probably. to ignore and not look. Yeah. yeah, we sequestered it. I mean, you think of the governor of New York, whose name I shall not name. He put them all uh, in nursing homes mm -hmm. so that we didn't have to see it happen. Don't let this drama unfold in a way that would involve anybody else, yeah. except maybe uh, one anonymous nurse mm -hmm. and a dead person. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what could be worse than that? 
I mean, death is already a sundering of soul from body. Why must you do it alone? Right. Mm -hmm. You need companionship. Mm -hmm. right. I think, I think that was the great uh, lesson that Pope Benedict gave us when he knelt before the Shroud of Turin yeah. and described it as the icon of Holy Saturday. Not only that Jesus died, but that he remained in death. He went down into the abode of death, the netherworld, and struck this bond, this cord of solidarity with the dead. You're not alone. I'm with you, and I represent life. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. went down into that abode with his wounds. Right. I mean, that's what the shroud right. reveals. Right. Uh, this man who was tortured to death, all of that shows up uh, mm -hmm. uh, on that shroud. Right. You're not alone with the one who has died, but again, the, the image that you use of Mary and Martha were not alone, and Jesus enters into their suffering as well. I mean, yeah. he's suffering himself, but you alluded earlier in the previous segment about God weeping. That's just, if we were to just stop and we could spend the rest of our life on that just text, could we not? That, that God himself weeps. So speak why that's so significant. Yeah. Well, you know, Pope Francis, uh, in a beautiful homily, I think, on one of the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, mm. for they shall be comforted. He speaks about uh, others offering a compassionate heart and hand by allowing uh, a breach to take place in their own hearts, you know, to become a wounded healer. Mm -hmm. Jesus understands our pain because he felt it. He experienced mm -hmm. that pain much more deeply, much more acutely because he was so pure, so innocent, but he felt that sense of abandonment. He entered into it and thus redeemed it from within. Because if he didn't do that, then we'd be able to say to God, you know, there's a part of my life that you have no idea mm. uh, uh, right, uh, right, what it was exactly, like. Exactly. Yeah. You know, in my study of Scripture, I'm always fascinated by the way that John has Jesus say the seven I am sayings, yeah. you know, mm. I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, but here I am the resurrection and the life. It's a lot like I am the bread of life because he restores his physical life, but he says I am the resurrection and the zoe, not bios. Right. I am the resurrection and the zoe. And there in John 10, right before this, he speaks of how he's going to lay down his life, but the, her, the, the Greek word is, is suke. That is, I'm going to lay down my soul. His soul will descend yeah. to the abode of the dead, as you put it so well. But there really is a sense in which I am the resurrection and the life is, you know, you keep using that word life or death, and it doesn't mean what you think it means. Right. You know, right. There is something so much greater than the life, the bios that I'm going to restore to his physical body um. that I think that's the only thing that really explains the delay. It isn't just, well, if I wait four days, I can really flex my divine muscles right. and pull off something They're better. Be yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Well, it speaks really to the deepest hope we have, the most desperate desire of all, mm -hmm. uh, that we would somehow surmount death, yeah. that bios need not be the last word, yeah. that there is real provision has been made for Zoe, yeah. for life, spiritual life. You know, that reminds me of something St. Thomas Aquinas says uh, in the Summa. He says that uh, nature never desires anything in vain no. and that the natural desire to live forever is actually evidence of the immortality of the soul. Yeah. That you can demonstrate that, that from the fact that a normal being wishes to live forever. Yeah. And since nature never desires anything in vain, it's, it simply has to be meaningful, yeah? yeah? Yeah, so one of my seminarians at the time was worried about a man who didn't believe in God, who was facing death and was scared, just really devastated by the possibility. And he went and he, he said that to the patient, uh, the man on his deathbed. Yeah. And the man, it gave him great comfort, even eased his yeah. burden, but also invited him t back into the church. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the French uh, philosopher Gabriel Marcel yeah. calls that the ontological mystery. Yeah. He, he insists that at the deepest level, nature really will answer positively the desires we have. Yeah. That if someone you love is, is ill uh, and you speak, you will, we, you will recover, you will be well. That somehow brings about 
the very thing that you most ardently long for. Yeah. Nature cannot refuse a request like that because it is so profound. It is so of a peace with man's own nature, this upward thrust yeah. of eros, right. this native need to be yeah. whole. Now, it needs Jesus to make it happen, yeah. but that we desire it, I think, is testimony to something more than, than bios. Yeah, and I think you refer to that in the book as a tropism. Yeah, a theotropism. A theotropism, right. theotropism. Yeah. I loved that. It yeah. put words on something I try to tell my students, which is praying is not just saying the rosary or you know going to the chapel. It's all day long, you have to somehow, part of you has to be angled upward. Just a slight turn yeah. of the attention up. And right. when I read that, I went, oh my gosh, that's what I'm talking about is a tropism, a that, theotropism. I mean, the, the shape of the banana. The shape right, of the I banana, or the sunflower. Upward, or the, as if it longed for the light. Right. You know, yeah. Against uh, the whole pressure of, yeah. of gravity. Yeah. It resists it. It yeah. refuses it. Yeah. It's a kind of defiant gesture. I will not go, I will not go quiet into, into that good start. night, yeah, that but I shall night. rage, rage against uh, the, dying uh, the dying of the light. If we may, just one of the other characters that we haven't really mentioned yet, and that's Mary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mary, so maybe just speak a word about Mary and her. Yeah, I mean, her. yeah she, she speaks to the contemplative side of, of not only uh, the church, but the human condition, mm -hmm. the need for prayer, uh, openness, receptivity. Mm -hmm. She's virginally ready all the time to receive from Jesus uh, the saving word. So she hopes, and, and her hope, I, I think, it, it doesn't translate uh, in, in the same terms as it does with Martha, right. who wants it to be done right now. Yeah. But Mary is so docile before Christ. She simply instinctively knows that things are gonna turn out all right. You, I, we won't be disappointed. I, I don't know how he's gonna <laughs> work around. this out, but he'll do it somehow. Yeah. Yes, but you say that it's the active one who goes yeah. and gets her, tells right. her, Jesus is here, he's asking for you, let's go. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and the necessity for both. So yes, we need yeah. both sides. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. We'll be right back for more Franciscan University Presents, so please stay with us. Whenever we come into a time of difficulty and maybe the question arises, God, do you love me? God, do you actually hear me? Do you actually know what I want? Why aren't you helping in this way? It's a good thing to, to recall, God, do you love me? And allow him to speak that truth of, yes, I love you. Look at the cross and resurrection of my son. And from that place where confidence is rebuilt, then you can go forward knowing that, that the Lord wills your good and that maybe this might actually be for a greater purpose. What if you discovered a university with unmatched science, faculty, and programs? A place where you didn't have to choose science over faith. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith-inspired, student-focused, research-driven programs leading to satisfying careers in medicine, scientific research, engineering, computer science, and many more science and health fields. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, education is more than just a word, it's a discovery. Welcome back and thank you so much for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we record here in the Comart studio at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment. Our theology professors, Dr. Deborah Savage and Dr. Scott Hahn and I are discussing Lazarus' death and the resurrection with Dr. Regis Martin. Uh, so Regis, so all of this, the story is leading us to the point where Jesus stands in front of the tomb and says, yeah. Lazarus. Yeah, I mean, that's the climactic it, isn't it? moment. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the crowd watching, I, I think, uh, harbor a certain amount of skepticism. You know, how can this be? What, what the hell is he doing they're here? I the mean, tune and Lazarus has been dead now. He's in four there. Four days. Four days. I mean, he's going to smell and, and we'll all recoil together and uh, think you're just an idiot uh, for coming along. But he's there, and he's not the least bit put off or daunted by, by this death. Uh, and he walks right in and squares off in front of the corpse and calmly speaks the words, Lazarus, get up, come out. Uh, and it happens. Uh, it's instantaneous. It's, it's sort of a radioactive moment. It changes everything. If he can do this, yeah. if he can walk into the cave of death, which also stands as a metaphor for the cave of my own sin and sorrow and suffering, 
And if he's not put off by any of that, if he can do that, then there is hope. Mm. It springs eternal. I don't have to worry. I don't need to be demoralized. Uh, you know, God can make up the losses of my own life. All I need to do is surrender to him and say, you take over, you take, you, you take charge. And he wants more than anything to walk into those caves, yeah. those you dark know, chambers. There's a sense in which then what the miracle accomplishes has a fringe benefit that is not unintended. Yeah. And that is, it's one thing to heal, to show that I can deliver you from suffering, illness, and even death. It's another thing to actually heal somebody of that paralyzing fear of suffering and death. Right, right, yeah. And it seems to me that he's doing the one in order to really dig deeper and to kind of pull out the other. Right. Because it is that fear of suffering and death that is so paralyzing, it is, it is so deceiving, you know. And th that I think it shows us that, that simultaneously there is this natural stupendous sign and then there's a very subtle, supernatural mystery that, wait, if he can say, Lazarus, come forth after four days, follow this man. You know, we have nothing anymore to fear. Right, yeah. And, and of course, if he, had, if he had not allowed Lazarus to languish in that tomb for four days, then we might never have known he was weeping. Yeah, yeah, His yeah, yeah. tears might never have... Uh, have fallen. Mm. He needed a reason, a human reason, and he is a human being. He's mm. connected to the human condition. He's got a stake in this man's life. They're friends. He's deeply uh, shattered by the news of his death, and he weeps. But if he just sort of effortlessly brought the guy back to life and, and said, you know, I don't need to cry about this because I know what I'm going right, to do. Right, right, I'm going right, to do it right, right now. now right. So right. shut up already and watch. You're going to be impressed. You'll be impressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This is another performance. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be cheap. Yeah. But I, I've always okay. reflected on it during the Triduum that that's important is that we can't just go through Good Friday where we know how the story ends, right? right. That, that I always encourage people just stay with the, the weirdness of, of Saturday morning after Good Friday, right. that, that yeah. emptiness and that quiet. Because as you've stated so beautifully, everybody has to go through this. So to be able to try to escape that. Yeah, we, uh, there was a beloved pastor at, at St. Peter's uh, who after the Mel Gibson movie had come out, I, I accosted him and I said, you know, you're gonna really wanna watch this. And he said, why should I? I know how the story ends. Mm -hmm. And that struck me as really sort of smug, complacent, mm -hmm. because you need to vicariously mm -hmm. experience it at least yeah, once or twice yeah. a year. And that's why the church commemorates it every year. We need to go into that same experience as Jesus did so that we can appreciate uh, the result, what he conquered. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, one of my favorite commentators is a Protestant, William Barclay, who writes the series that Fulton Sheen recommended, you know, and all of that. But when he comes to Lazarus in his commentary on John, he's so disappointing because on the one hand he says, why is this not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, it would have been if it actually had happened. And you're like, that's a big what? step there. Unplug right. the TV. Right. You know, it's like, come on. You know, but it is a question that needs to be addressed, and that is, why is John the only one to tell this story? He just tells it so well that, you know, anybody else would feel like, well, why bother? Right. But on the other hand, uh, nobody ever mentions Lazarus in the other Gospels except curiously for Luke, in Luke 16. Yeah. Uh, everybody assumes it's a parable, but in no other parable does Jesus actually attach a name to the character, yeah. much less the name of his close friend. And in this so-called parable, Lazarus is sick, and then he dies, yeah. and the rich man says, oh, raise him and send him back to my brothers. No. Even if, you know, if they haven't listened to Moses and the law and the prophets, they're not going to listen even to a man who's raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. And Lazarus proves them right in John's right. gospel because they target him for death again after yeah. his testimony is so profound and persuasive. But I mean, it just seems to me that the story itself cannot be, you don't press fast forward. Right. You know, right. not only savor the moment, but all of the moments that go up into this. I mean, the four days that he delays. Yeah. But also the texture of Luke's composite where, huh, 
I wonder if that Lazarus is more than just a parabolic character. Right. right. Yeah, I don't want to get sidetracked on, on that, but I, I, your point, I think, is really interesting that, that in the resurrection of Lazarus, you've got the population that you're saying the next chapter are going to say, okay, we need to kill them both, right? I mean, <laughs> it just speaks to the hardness of heart that, yeah. that somebody can do something beautiful and wonderful and amazing, but you can still are not able to see it. And I think we do that in the church sometimes is we, we characterize an individual and they can do something beautiful and wonderful, but still we're, we dismiss right. that. It, it's sort of like uh, the, the overly pious who would reproach Jesus for having uh, died naked. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the ones who really want to pounce on Jesus uh, because he's performing miracles on the Sabbath. Yeah. What were you thinking? Uh, why would you do something like that? Right. I mean, that kind of scrupulosity, uh, yeah. you know, needs, needs to be smashed. Yeah. Uh, and Jesus', Jesus his whole life, I think, is a, a testimony against that kind of narrow-mindedness, that rigidity, yeah. that it's morbid scary. piety. But it's more than scrupulosity. I mean, yeah. these people want to kill right, right, Lazarus. Right, right, right. Hasn't he gone it's through enough hard. already? Yeah, right. I mean, what the, the real <laughs> message That would have been a miracle <laughs> yeah. second time. But, I mean, there is death. Yeah. And then there is death. Yeah. Yeah. The right. people who want to kill him are far more dead. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's what the catechism speaks of original sin as the death of the soul. Yeah. We fear the death of the body. We don't recognize yeah. Right. Yeah. that the Holy Spirit absent from the soul brings about a divine death that is more deadly. Yeah. Can I just yeah. ask, why do you think that is? Why, why are the people so afraid? Yeah. Why do they want to kill Lazarus actually? Envy. Right. Just envy. Pilate yeah. could envy. see right through it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there was a resentment, not only that we can't do that, and he can, uh -huh. but he's not only showing us up, he's showing us down. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. Power, authority. Exactly. Um, this yeah. isn't the way it's supposed to be written. Uh, yeah. It's gonna cause me to change. It's gonna cause me to believe. It's gonna cause me to, I mean. Yeah, 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 well, I have to change the way I'm living. Yeah, all of that, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Pilate yeah. could perceive that it was out of envy that they handed him over yeah, right. to death. Yeah. But even if we grant uh, utter sincerity to what they did, uh, <laughs> what they did was of course wicked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But maybe some of them acted upon the purest of motives. They were convinced this guy is blaspheming. Mm -hmm. He's pretending to be God. Mm -hmm. And there is no greater sin than that affront that he practices, putting himself in the place of God. He's not God, yeah. so he must be a liar or he's crazy. We've got to get rid of him. Or it's a plot it. or something. Yeah. It's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It's understandable. If, if maybe, Regis, so Jesus calls Lazarus out, he comes. Maybe a word or two, because you spent some time speaking beautifully again uh, about uh, taking away the bandages, the, the mm. crowd that was around him. And I thought that was a beautiful image. And then also you mentioned to it already, but the silence, there's something about the silence that I still haven't yeah. reconciled. I yeah. mean, I would have told everybody. I mean, I, you couldn't shut me up. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, I mean, think about that. If you, if you die and, and uh, you have an after death experience in, another dimension, and then you're rudely, brusquely brought back to the flesh. I, I think you'd be sort of dumbfounded, stupefied in the light of what you had seen, a glimpse, maybe a glint of this distant glory. So when you come back, uh, you're somewhat preoccupied <laughs> with <laughs> what you had seen yeah. and felt and seemingly touched. Yeah. Also, you're impatient to get back there. Yeah. I mean, how, I, I don't know, back to Steubenville after the splendor of paradise. Well, it, it's a bit of a letdown, yeah, right? A bit boring. <laughs> you know, how dull can this now be? Yeah, like, and you let say, me get back you beyond say, the, the sorry, wardrobe. You say in the book, I love this line, that this is uh, God the Father is the still point yeah. for Jesus, the unmoving reality. And it seems to me that maybe that's what Lazarus felt was connected yeah. to that still point, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, just, I mean, a, a longing, a holy longing yeah, yeah. Uh, for the Father who is his meat and drink. Yeah. When Jesus cries out from the cross, I thirst, mm -hmm. it's not just for uh, a Coca-Cola. He's really thirsting for the presence of the Father yeah. who seemingly is absent. Yeah. And he feels that absence, that hunger and thirst for his meat and drink. And that's part of his suffering. I long to be joined once yeah. more to the Father, but in my human nature, I'm really separated. I, I, I feel forlorn, abandoned, right. desolate. Right. And that reminds me, the most meaningful moment of the Triduum for me is Holy Thursday when they strip the altar and they take Jesus away. Yeah. Every single year. That's haunting. I think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm lost. Yeah. Yeah. I have nothing to look at, nothing to genuflect yeah. 
too. And so the, to me, when he returns, it really feels like that every year. It's yeah, such and not suffering. only the altar uh, is stripped, but the tabernacle, the tabernacle is empty. Yeah, that's what I mean. As if to signify yeah. God is dead, yeah. he's not here. No, I know. And so the, what you guys were saying earlier about needing to not push fast forward, yeah. It's to, on Holy Thursday, the moment where I want to stay. I want to stay there and experience that feeling yeah. of realizing I'm lost without Him. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you very um, articulately, you, you point the, I think that's what Mary and Martha were wrestling with is, is that, that emptiness that was there, right? That yeah. their friend was gone and then again inviting Jesus <clears throat> to come into the midst of that. Right. Well, their brother. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. And, yeah, why wouldn't he feel this so deeply that he would want to do something about it? And they have this implicit faith and confidence that he could. He could jolly well work a miracle if only he were disposed to do so. So that he doesn't suggests maybe a kind of indifference. Mm. I mean, Romano Guardini, I, mm. I quote in the book, yes. he uses the word monstrous. Yeah. It seems almost monstrous that Jesus would, would delay his return. Yeah. Why would, he, why would he be so insensitive, at least outwardly so? He's helping them understand the point of the play. That's exactly <laughs> right. We've got Maybe. a couple more acts yeah. we have to get right. through. Yeah. Yeah. Without that, they never will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then finally, that earlier in the story, he was sleeping and he is awakened. Yeah. Is, is this ultimately the point, is that, yeah. that what appeared to the world, we've yeah. talked before about the movie The Sixth Sense, they're dead and they don't yeah. even know it, yeah. right? So I there's know, the, yeah. the converse that's going on here. Yeah, and the character says, I see dead people. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's really chilling. Right. They don't know they're dead. But they don't yeah. know they're yeah. dead. They only see what they want to see. Right, right. but yeah. these people thought he was dead, but in fact, right. the Lord was well, that, I mean, that's Augustine's point uh, to Martha and Mary. Lazarus uh, is dead, but to Jesus, he's merely sleeping, right. which means he's not at all uh, disconcerted or uh, 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 mm. undone by death. It, it doesn't really pose a final challenge. I, I can do this. I, I've faced it. I've conquered death, and I'm going to show you that really it is a kind of sleeping. And if you're not afraid to sleep, then why shouldn't you be afraid to die? Mm. And then in the midst of it, having experienced death of loved ones, the, the sadness, and this one of the things I took away is, the, and, and I know this, but the sadness is, it's, it's real, it's holy. Yeah. The, the, the fact that I weep at the death of a loved one doesn't mean that I don't have faith. Right. right. It's just that I weep at the death of a loved one, right? right. That yeah. separation and that distance that, that yeah. causes the human heart to long yeah. and suffer. Yeah, I mean, if you didn't weep, then it would argue to a kind of terrifying insensibility. You yeah. just don't care. You're utterly indifferent. And in no way is it a, a lack of faith. Right. Right, yeah. Do you no. think the fact that Jesus weeps is an indication that that's been redeemed also, that that's you know, what, what, which Jesus. is not assumed is yeah, not I, redeemed. And I think in that, that I experience the Lord's presence in, in my suffering, my weeping, knowing that I'm not alone. Yeah. Up next, our panel, our guests will share their final thoughts on Lazarus, death, and the resurrection. Please stay with us. There was a time in my life where I was bedridden for six months, and that just, it very much made it hard to live. Um, and I remember I was praying the rosary through all of that, and I was encountering the sorrowful mysteries and Jesus kind of highlighted that at the cross there's very few of his friends, very few of his disciples present at the cross. And he kind of in, gave this invitation to me in my illness, like, Austin, will you suffer with me? Because few friends are willing to go to the cross with me. And as I turned over my suffering to Jesus, I just experienced an outpouring of the Spirit, especially in the gift of joy, because my suffering was no longer just suffering, but it was actually united to Jesus. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu where your faith and career can connect online. And welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Deborah, it's a, been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Maybe your final thoughts. 
Yeah, what I, I would add something we haven't spoken about yet, really, and that is the great literary treatment that you provide as an undercurrent oh. for the text. It's just astonishing. And it seems to me that most of the time, systematic theologians will explore the in the something in the original language, let's say, or compare it to a category in systematic theology. But what you've done is you brought to bear all the great authors, maybe not all of them, but so many, which Large you quote here. without guile oh. or pomp or anything like that, just seamlessly, astonishing. And what I found was how, how much more deeply I grasped the meaning of this gospel, this passage, this story, in your doing that. It made me appreciate what we've spoken about, this need to be widely read. It's not like it's other reading. It's the reading of my tradition that sheds light on a way to interpret and go more deeply into the, into the gospel. It was astonishing. It's sort of like what we've said already, that you can just go through the steps and you finally get to the end and everyone knows how the story ends. But what you did was you built the dramatic tension and revealed to me that the significance of my part in my, in my own life. When I got to that section about King Lear, I realized what you'd been trying to tell me and what Jesus was trying to tell me, that I'm, I'm the hero of my own mm -hmm. life and I have to submit to the dialogue and the plot line yeah. that the author is imposing on me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let yeah. him write. Beautiful. And let him write Beautiful. it. Yeah. I want to commend you for this poetic style of theologizing, which yeah. has always been your trademark in writing and in lecturing. Uh, it's what is so enjoyable to your students and colleagues. Uh, I wish I had read this book before I wrote my book. <laughs> I wrote a book called Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body, and it came out right at the time COVID came out. Yum. And so it just seemed awful timing until it proved to be very beneficial. But this is what I wish that I had read because honestly, you do quote in a less than 130 pages over 130 people. Mm -hmm. And they are salient quotes. They're yeah. just unforgettable. But actually, the most quotable material are not the quotes that you're citing, but the, the comments and the reflections that you're sharing. Yeah. But there is one that really stands out to me, and that is on page 112. I just reread this this morning in my devotions. I, I was reading a book, Journey Through Lent, for Lent, and then ever since Easter, I have been reading and rereading this. And I am so blessed by it for so many reasons. But when Father Delp, the German oh, Jesuit, yeah, yeah. is scheduled to die shortly by hanging, he tells the prison chaplain, in half an hour, I'll know more than you do. <laughs> it's like so much and so little. You That's know? So good. And life is you know, changed, it's not ended, but life is transformed. When you go through this door of death with Jesus, you really do come out on the other side. And you don't have to wait until your expiration date arrives. <laughs> you really can die to self and live to Him now. And, and, and the hope that we have is not just that we'll get to heaven, but that the hope is that heaven will get to us even now. Yeah. And uh, the book does that. It really lifts the heart, it lifts the head, it lifts the soul, it lifts the body. And so I, I thank you and I commend this to all of our audience because this was delectable. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Definitely well, perfect. thank you so much. I'm really moved by those uh, kind words. Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, one of uh, the poets whom I wish I had quoted uh, more uh, copiously than I did, Gerard Manley Hopkins, mm -hmm. once wrote a poem called That Nature is a Heraclesian Fire and of the Comfort of the Resurrection, which I think says it all. Uh -huh. Heraclitus lived five centuries before the coming of Christ, which changed everything. And he was fixated upon change. Right. And he used fire as the elemental force that defines the cosmos, because fire is destructive. Mm -hmm. It consumes everything uh, and makes everything change. Yeah. You can't step into the same river twice. So change uh, is the best way of understanding life, flux, death. We all must die. So. What Hopkins does is give Heraclitus his due, the integrity of nature. We have to recognize it's violent, it's predatory, it's determined to destroy us. Let's accept that. Let's concede the high ground to nature. 
but let's also allow the comfort of the resurrection to insert itself, that miraculous moment, into this Heraclesian fire. You know, flesh fade uh, and mortal trash die. Uh, the residuary worm will somehow have the last word. But then Hopkins says, enough, or as the Italians would say, basta, because I am all at once what Christ was, because he is what I am. He entered into death, and he changed it utterly. It's not the same. Death is now our friend. I mean, isn't this the great sentiment of Francis, your yeah. founder? Death, you know, my brother, my sister, yeah. death. Worried I don't need to victory. worry about death. Death, uh, I, I, you know, I, I should cultivate an awareness of death, a lively sense of death. Death is coming, and I must not fear uh, his approach because uh, alongside him, is Jesus, who yeah. has already experienced death. He's not worried about it, so why, why should I worry? I mean, that, I think, is the ultimate ground of, of comfort. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Regis. Um, uh, we have this article from Regis's book. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, we would invite you to write us, Looking for Lazarus. This handout is yours for free by simply going to faithandreason.com or by calling the number on the screen that you see below. Um, first off, Regis, I, I again want to thank you for the time and the effort uh, that went into this. Um, but it wasn't just the work. Y you, you read every page, and every, I agree with what was just said. Just the, your mind and your intellect and, and your sources were beautiful. But I think it was a, it was a, a fruit of prayer, is, is that mm. you prayed through this. And, and, and by that, you created and, and formed this book that I'm just very grateful for. As a, as a 22-year-old kid, I sat in your class, and I've told you this before, but one of your classes had a profound impact on my life and changing and uh, how I saw the church and how I saw myself in the Lord. So you've been just a great blessing to me in this book. I think will be a great blessing to others. I shared with Regis earlier that when my brother Mark passed away that this was the gospel that I chose for his funeral. And I reflected on that, that there will be a day that each one of us in death is going to hear Jesus, call out our name. Yeah. You know, Lazarus, come forth. And, mm -hmm. and I, I love to reflect and just think about what was that his experience in, the, in that darkness and in the, in the silence to him hearing that shattered his name. Yeah. And then I just reflected on that, that, that each, there will be a day that each one of us hears that. You know, and, and I reflected on my brother, Mark, uh, the Lord calling him, Mark, come forth. And, but, but, but there was a moment of comfort because A, that Mark went into death, we go into death, knowing that Jesus has already gone there, yeah, right? That yeah. it's not this void, but it's this, this presence. But that also Mark recognized his voice, right? That, yeah. that when Lazarus hears, I'm sure Mary called out, and I'm sure Martha called right. out, and other people called out, but it wasn't until he, it wasn't until right. Jesus called out that was a voice that he recognized and say, I want to go to that voice. And, right. yeah. and I just celebrate the fact that one day each one of us will be able to hear uh, our names called and say, come out. So thank yeah, you for that. Sure. So yeah. we just want to let everyone know of our continued prayers that as we, each one of us are on this journey of faith that ultimately will lead to the Lord Jesus crying out and calling out to each one of us to come out. So may the Lord pour out his blessings upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com, where you can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu. Or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800 783-6447.